Good morning, good morning, good morning. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we are gathering together virtually for our Sunday school lesson. Uh, we're going to continue in the book of Daniel. Uh, last week, we went over chapter 1, and we left off on meeting Daniel and his friends and seeing them interviewed by the king and being found ten times uh, as, as knowledgeable, as wise, as his best and his brightest. And we now come to chapter two and we see that there is a couple of years that have passed in terms of the training of these young men. And if you would just come to Daniel chapter 2, and just let's just look at verse 1 and 3 to begin if you're looking at your handout. And so we're going to see, first off, a dream concealed a dream concealed, if you're looking at your first bl blank. Let's take a look at verses 1 through 3. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king and the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. So now we find that Nebuchadnezzar is in his second year reigning as king over Babylon and when we count his uh, year of accession, this would have been at the end of the third year of Daniel and his friends training, okay? Because the way Babylonians kept time, because you might be wondering, why does it say in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, but then it said that Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were in training for three years. You're wondering, why is one three and why is one two? two in terms of the second year well that's because of how they kept record of the reign of kings so in the the partial year they would consider that your accession year and and then your first full year would be counted as one and then your your next year so on and so forth so the time frame does line up when we take into account how babylonians kept time and so Nebuchadnezzar is, is, is recorded by the Bible to have had dreams, plural. And he had these dreams, and, and there was something about these dreams that troubled him in his spirit. So it wasn't a physical pain. It wasn't what he ate the night before for dinner that kept him up. But it was something in his spirit that troubled him so much that he was kept up all night. It says that his sleep left him. And so Nebuchadnezzar uh, goes with what he knows. So he decides that, well, if I have had these dreams and I can't understand it, as king, let me call in my, my cabinet. Let me call in the, the, the Babylonian spiritual advisory committee. And so in verse 2 it says, Then the king gave command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. And of course, when the king called, they had to answer. So they came and stood before the king, okay? Whenever 
we look at magicians, astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. What Nebuchadnezzar, who Nebuchadnezzar was calling, he was calling the top professors. He was calling the top traffickers in the occult, okay? So he called the, the, the head honcho that wrote out the horoscopes. He called the president of the psychic hotline. He called uh, in people that had some type of way of, of what the Bible would call divination, that there is some way that they, that they would communicate, so they said, with the spirit world. And so he gets four different groups of people to come in and tell him his dream. And so he says to them that I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now, this is a, a, a portion where we have to be very careful because in, in some translations or if you look at, you know, certain uh, commenters on the Bible, they would say that uh, for him to know the dream that, that somehow he forgot the dream. But the, the, the Bible doesn't give us any indication. So the word there when he says to know really means that he wants to understand. He's trying to understand what it means. I know what happened. I, I know what I saw, but I don't know what it means. So looking at your handout, Nebuchadnezzar had the same dream multiple times. Same dream multiple times. So if you look at verse 1, he says that uh, the verse 1 says that Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. So he was having multiple dreams at the same time. But when he talks to his spiritual advisory committee, he tells them that I have had a dream. So that gives us the indication that God was trying to speak to Nebuchadnezzar through dreams, which we do see multiple times in the Bible. And we even see now in, in modern times, those that are, that are uh, outside of Christian nations have reported that Jesus has come to them in their dreams. So we have this happening even now. But Nebuchadnezzar, as a pagan king, with his pagan spiritual advisory, he knows there's something to this dream, but he doesn't know quite what's going on. But he does the be he goes with the best that he had to understand. That's your second blank. He goes with the best that he had to understand. And that's what a lot of people are doing nowadays. Just like Nebuchadnezzar turned to uh, essentially a cabal, a group of people that are the modern day equivalent of the psychic hotline, tarot cards, and horoscopes. He did what he, what, what he thought was the best explanation that he could get at the time. And so when he brings these people in, he says that he wants to know the dream, referring to gaining understanding. So we have the dream concealed, Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream over and over and over again. He's trying to find a way to understand what it means. And so now we'll go into verse 4 and see what his spiritual advisory committee uh, decides to tell him. So look at me with verse 4 through 13. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation... You shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered, being the Chaldeans and the sorcerers and the magicians, they answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, 
and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So wow, we're, so so now we've gone from uh, a dream and a demand to now a decision and a decree in uh, verses four through thirteen. So important to note that that the the so-called wise men they try to get out of the king's request in verse four. They they try to flatter him first. They try to flatter him. They say, "Oh, oh, king, live forever." Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. So what they're used to doing is uh, being able to just have something told to them and then they can give some type of uh, answer that is supposedly from uh, heaven, supposedly from the spirit world. And usually they, they do these things in very vague type of terms so that it's very difficult to pin them down as to whether or not what they said was right or wrong. You know, so it's kind of the same thing when you, if someone were to call the psychic hotline and, and you want to hear what your future is, because that's what, that's what Nebuchadnezzar is trying to figure out. He's, he's conquered the known world. So when you've accomplished everything, there's only one thing to consider. What's next? Because I've already done everything else. But so if, if someone were to call the psychic hotline and they ask you, well, what is your concern? Well, if you're a psychic, you should know what my concern is. And then they try to, you know, wave their hand over a globe and tell you some vague things about things that might happen in the future that you can't really pin down. And then they want to ask you for your credit card number. Well, if you're a psychic, you should know my credit card number. You know? And so Nebuchadnezzar did the best with what he thought he had. And people today are trying to do the same things. And they're running to the horoscopes and the tarot cards and the psychic hotline. And they're running to uh, healing crystals and all kinds of different things that have no basis in the word of truth. And so Nebuchadnezzar is, uh, is pretty sharp. He sees the game that they're trying to play. He sees the game they're trying to play. So he said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm serious about this. To give a contemporary translation, I'm serious about this. I need you to tell me the dream itself and I need you to tell me the interpretation because what was happening right here is this spiritual advisory committee, to put it in contemporary terms, they're trying to finesse Nebuchadnezzar. They're trying to gloss over and get around what it is that he's actually asking them to do so that they can get out of the situation. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, OK, well, well maybe you're not understanding me, so I'm going to put uh, a, a little incentive program in place to make you try a little harder. He says that, that if you can do it, 
if you can give me the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. And so I'm going to say it one more time. Tell me the dream and its interpretation. So they answered again, and they think maybe he's playing. They said, well, you know, maybe, you know, you, you uh, don't understand how this works, king. I mean, we don't really do that. So if you just tell us the dream, and then we give you interpretation. That's how this works. It's give and take, king. We, you know, you, you know don't, be, don't be that guy. Just, just tell us. So the king answers and says, okay, look, I know that you're trying to gain time. I know you're trying to buy time. I know you're trying to stall answering my command. And so he says, look, I'll make it very simple, is that it's one or the other. Either you give me the dream and the interpretation, or I'm just going to take you out. Now, I'm not talking about taking you out of position. I'm talking about taking you out of, out of existence. Does that make sense? So he says, there's one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. See, Nebuchadnezzar's dad was the ruler before him. And in this time period, kings didn't always have a long tenure. They didn't always have a long tenure. So... Sometimes you could kind of stall things out because they might get assassinated, they might get ill, some invading army might come in. So you could kind of stall some things, and you had this bureaucracy that stayed in power regardless of who the king was, regardless of who the nation was, because someone had to run the government. And so they're like, maybe we can put him off. And so he's like, no, look, 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 we're we're not going to wait till the time changes. Tell me the dream. And give me its interpretation. So finally, they fess up. They declare moral and spiritual bankruptcy before the king. They fess up and say, look, man, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. So they're saying that, King, the, the reason we can't do it is because it can't be done. It, it, it can't be. It's not that we don't want to do it. It's not that we're not trying hard enough. It's not that we didn't study. It's impossible for this to be done among men. So they say it's, it's, it's so difficult to do what you're asking, King, that that. No one can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So they're saying, look, you need something that's above and beyond us. Because only the gods, only a deity, only something supernatural to man is going to be able to reveal this to you. So now that he sees that his spiritual advisory committee is morally and spiritually bankrupt, He's like, well, I really don't need you anymore. So the king was angry, look at verse 12, and very furious, and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So we see a decision and a decree. If you're looking at your handout, this is very important. The language changes from Hebrew in verse 3 to Aramaic in verse 4. The language, not only what they're speaking changes, but also the text of Scripture changes. And this change, that was your, that was your first under decision and degree, Hebrew to Aramaic. And then the change signifies a shift in communication from Jews to Gentiles. God is now using the, the lingua franca at the time, the, the uh, court speech, the language of the Gentiles would have been at this time Aramaic. And so now God is declaring something to the world about the world. And he's going to speak to the world in their own language. So the Chaldeans replied that there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. 
And they go on to say that there was no other who can tell it to the king except the gods. So since they're spiritually and morally bankrupt, they don't have any type of belief in a personal God. Their idea of God, and I'm referring to the Chaldeans and the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, their idea of God is some uh, being that's far off that is not really interested in the affairs of man, but maybe through certain religious ceremonies and, and techniques, they can catch the attention of this supernatural deity and get them to do what they want them to do. And because there's no concept of a personal relationship with, uh, in their words, the gods, then they say that there is no way that we can do what you, what you want us to do. And, and don't miss that. Pause right there and because it says that there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. I thank God that there is a man the God-man in Jesus Christ that, that can tell me the matter of anything, that can, that can reveal to me what is going on in any situation, that is all-knowing and all-powerful to where he has the answer to any question I could possibly ask. And so we see Nebuchadnezzar is now taking out all these wise men, but now we see the camera pan to Daniel and his companions. So now we see that Daniel and his companions, even though they haven't done anything wrong, because they're in a particular group of people, because they live in a particular place, because they have a particular profession, because they go to a particular school, they're caught up in this trial and tribulation that is uh, brought down by the king. So now we go from a dream concealed to a dream revealed. We go from a dream concealed to a dream revealed. Look at verse 14 through 19. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is this decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So look at verse 14. We see uh, that we've gone from the dream and the demand of the king and then the decision and the decree of the king to now we see of Daniel and his friends discernment and diplomacy. Discernment and diplomacy. So Daniel uh, gets a visit from the captain of the king's guard, Arioch. And so we already heard in verse 13 that they were killing the wise men. Killing, that's an action verb, killing. It means it's happening as we speak. They weren't thinking about it. It was happening. So, so Arioch was going around to the different uh, uh, chambers of residence of these members of the Spiritual Advisory Committee and he's been killing them one by one. And finally, he knocks on Daniel's door, or they ran into each other in the hallway. And the Bible says, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel 
answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. But Daniel, somehow, some way, whatever he said, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what he said, but the Bible does record for us that in the New King James Version, with counsel and wisdom, he answered. So somehow, some way, he began to reason together with Arioch to not kill him where he stood on sight. And as they go in this conversation, Daniel brings up, why is this decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch tells Daniel, well, look, he had a dream, and he asked for the dream and the interpretation. He asked again. They said they couldn't. It's a problem. He wants everybody gone. So now that Daniel knows the situation, because of his upbringing, because of his time in training as a young man back in Judah and also the training that he got, there was something that allowed him to reason with Arioch. And so he says, look, um, let me go talk to the king. Let me live long enough to go talk to the king. And then if it doesn't work out, hey, man, I understand. But in verse 16, Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king in the, uh, the, the interpretation. So notice the difference between the pagan spiritual advisory committee and Daniel. The pagan spiritual advisory committee, they know that what they're doing isn't going to provide any real answer. So they have to try to dance around the situation. When they're pinned down and it's, hey, tell me the truth about this situation, they know they have nothing to offer. So they have no choice but to try to dance around the situation. But Daniel goes straight into the conversation with the king and doesn't say that he can't do it. He just says, give me some time. Now, Probably, most likely, the reason that the king honored this, requ this request is because of what we learned at the end of chapter 1, which was that when the king interviewed them, looking at verse 1, I'm sorry, verse 19 of chapter 1, he, the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. Verse 20, and in all matters of, matters of wisdom and understanding about the king examined them, he found them ten times better than the magicians and astrologers who were all in his realm. So he knows that, hey, this is my, this is my young prodigy that's ten times as smart as the other guys that I'm having killed. So because of Daniel not compromising in chapter 1, and because of his reputation being built in his interaction with the king, it's likely that's the reason that Nebuchadnezzar allowed him time. But Daniel didn't say that it couldn't be done. He just says, give me some time, king. Give me some time. So now Daniel has, has said this, but he hasn't discussed this with anyone. He's just asked for time, and he's demonstrating tremendous faith, tremendous faith that he knows that there is a God that sits high and looks low. There is a God that he serves that if no one on earth can tell it, that God can tell it. So at this point, now it's a matter of him praying to God for what it is that he needs to satisfy the king. So Daniel and his companions proceed to pray that they may not perish with the rest. Daniel went to his house in verse 17 and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So on your handout, Daniel and his companions proceed to pray that they might not perish with the rest. So 
when, when I see that, you got to take a moment and take a look at your own individual personal prayer life. When you run up against some type of difficult situation, where is the first place that you go for help? When you run into the trials and the tribulations of life, do you try to sort it out with tarot cards and horoscopes and tea leaves and chakras and healing crystals, incense? Is, is that where you go? Do you go to the word of God? Do you go to your friends? Who do you go to? Whenever you run into life's difficult situations, because understand, this is a life or death situation. This isn't uh, uh, some trivial matter. Daniel is literally uh, trying to figure out how it is that on the one hand, he will not have to compromise and he can stay faithful to God. But also at the same time, I'm pretty sure that Daniel wanted to keep his head on his shoulders. So how can we do this all at the same time? So he decides, look, we're going to have an emergency prayer meeting right now. So Daniel and his friends, they start praying, and they're praying so that they would not perish. At some point in the prayer meeting, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And you might wonder, how do, I, how do I know that that's what happened? Well, because there's a difference between a dream and a vision. Looking at your handout, a dream comes when you are asleep. A vision comes when you are awake. So it's very specific that the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. A night vision. And so when Daniel gets this vision... So they're all praying, and thank God for some praying friends, that whenever you have a situation that, that you have somebody that you can call on, that you have some friends that would stand with you and pray with you, church family, your pastors, your deacons, people that will, that will go before the Lord in prayer with you and for you. But in this particular case, Daniel gets a night vision. And when he gets this vision, the first thing he does is he blesses the God of heaven. He blesses the God of heaven. Let's look at verse 20 to 23, and we will conclude there. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we have asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. So now we go from uh, the dream concealed with Nebuchadnezzar and his spiritual advisory committee to the dream revealed with Daniel and God. We saw the discernment and diplomacy of Daniel in relating to the government of his time, and then now we see deference and doxology. Deference and doxology on the part of Daniel and his friends. And so Daniel, first he praises God for his omniscience. Then he praises God for his omnipotence. Those just mean that God is all-knowing and that God is all-powerful. So omniscience, that God knows all there is to know. And that omnipotence, God is all-powerful to do anything that he desires. 
just turn with me real quickly to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44, two verses, verse 24 and 25, that I think bear on this particular passage. Isaiah 44, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 44, verse 24 and 25 reads as such. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Verse 25, who frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness. Daniel may have recalled or had some type of feeling similar to this. Understanding this passage in our time now, we can see that God already wrote out the end from the beginning. That he already knew that there was going to be this type of situation. And even though there are people that deny that there is a one true God that has revealed himself especially in the Bible, he declares that it is he who stretches out all the heavens all alone. He alone has created everything that we can see and everything that we cannot see, and he spreads abroad the earth by himself. So calling back to, to him as the creator God, but he says that even now he frustrates the signs of the babblers and drives the diviners mad. You see, this spiritual advisory committee, they were diviners. They couldn't figure out which way was up when it came to telling the dream and its interpretation. And turns wise men backward. They had to turn around. They had to say that we are morally and spiritually bankrupt in this matter king and their knowledge was made foolishness but Daniel blessed the God of heaven because he has wisdom and might and Daniel recognizes that in verse 23 that the God of his fathers has given him wisdom and might and we'll say we'll see later on in the chapter but for right now let it suffice that there's nothing that we have that is our own and that we have produced ourselves when people talk about being a self-made man I'm still trying to figure out what they mean they may have done well with the resources and the opportunities that were afforded to them but they did not make themselves. Why? Because, again, back in Isaiah, he who formed you from the womb. We're not self-made, we're God-made. And so Daniel gives thanks and praise because he knows there's no other way that this could have happened because the one thing that the spiritual advisory committee that the pagans got right the one thing they got right was when they said that there is uh, not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. It can't happen. We need God for this. We need God for this. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. So they, they got one thing right in the whole situation. And Daniel, now that he's received from the Lord what he needs in order to give the king the interpretation and give the king the dream, they have to give thanks and praise to the Lord. They have to give thanks and praise to the Lord. So Daniel demonstrates, he uh, demonstrates uh, his Christian character by uh, not just folding in the situation so he stands with courage he has faith in God that if there's anyone that can deliver him out of this situation it is God 
And then he has the faith enough to pray and ask that God would reveal that which he needs in order to have his life saved, in order to have his life spared. And then when he gets what he asks for from God, he gives thanks and praise. I would just encourage us as we uh, go on this week that, that when we pray in faith and we receive, that we give credit where credit's due, that we give thanks and praise to the God of heaven and not try to take the credit for ourselves, that it was because we were so smart or because we were so wise or because we went to this school or because we have these degrees or these letters before our name or letters after our name or because we prepared so so diligently. It is none of these things. You are where you are in your personal life, in your professional life, your finances, all these things. They're all blessings from the Lord. And we have to give thanks and praise to him for what he's given us uh, just to show uh, that we at least recognize that he is the source of all things. All things come of thee, O Lord, of thine own I have given thee. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. So we studied the first half of, of Daniel uh, chapter 2. And I look forward to uh, going into uh, Daniel explaining the dream itself and its interpretation in the second half. You'll have to come see us on Wednesday for Bible study at 1130 a.m. We'll be streaming on Facebook Live and then also putting that back up on YouTube. Um, but that is our Sunday school lesson today. Uh, our time is, 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 uh, has been spent. And uh, I wish you grace and peace as you go to love and serve the Lord.